Hello and welcome to Online Feeder School, a two-day virtual workshop focusing on one of the most important roles on the dairy, the feeder. My name is Betsy Hicks of the South Central New York Dairy and Field Crops team with Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'll be walking you through the start of our program today. Feeder School is put on by Cornell Cooperative Extension, Regional Dairy Specialists, and Cornell Pro Dairy. The regional dairy specialists around New York State have collaborated to build content and prepare for today's school in a virtual setting. You'll hear, you'll hear from several of our dairy specialists over the two-day program. This virtual workshop is made possible by sponsorship from industry, and we'd like to take a minute and thank our gold sponsors, Holtz Nelson Nutrition, Belchem, Purina, Gold Star Feed and Grain, MILC Group, Chris Hansen, Rap Nutrition, and Farm Credit East. We'd also like to thank our silver sponsors, Standard Dairy Consultants, Adiseo, Lutz Feed, Trow Nutrition, and Louis Gallen Son. If you work with these companies, be sure to thank them for their support to keep this school free. On day one, we covered economics of feeding, monitoring dry matter and bunk base management. And today in day two, we'll be covering feed bunk management. You'll be hearing from dairy specialist Casey Havakis from the North Country Regional Ag Team and Dave Albion of the Central New York Dairy Field Team. Um, we'll also be hearing from Dr. Bill Stone uh, of Diamond V. He'll be covering troubleshooting mixer wagons. And then finally, we'll be featuring a safety video from Lalamond. So just to start out the day, the feeder has so many factors that affect how they do their job, making it one of the most important roles on the farm. How they work together definitely affects how effectively the farm can perform day in and day out, be efficient and be profitable. Because so many of these areas have to do with what is fed and how it impacts cows, it's important to understand the basics of nutrition and herd dynamics as it pertains to dairy cows so that your role as a feeder can be as effective as possible for the farm. So today, throughout the, the day, we have two different things to help keep your attention and help you apply the, the information that you're seeing. The first, the same as we did on day, day one, is the scorecard. So throughout the presentation, there's many checkpoints for you to grade yourself on how you're doing at your farm. Max points for each scorecard situation is five points. And the point is to give you an idea of the areas that you may need to focus on at your own farm to get better results. Secondly is the feeder challenge. So when we host feeder school in real life, it's a lot more fun and we incorporate this challenge. So in the virtual world, we have a few questions per section to help you apply the information to a real life scenario. If you would like the scorecard and feeder challenge as a PDF, please feel free to enter into the chat your email address to the panelists and we will get you that information. Um, sooner than we would. Uh, we will be recording these, uh, these presentations today, and we will be making that available with the PDFs of the slideshow um, as we get those wrapped up. So you can expect those. If you would like the scorecard and Peter challenge sooner than that though, please let us know. So lastly, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A box at any point during the presentations. Please try to put your questions in that Q&A box that pertains to the presentations. If you have comments, please feel free to put them into the chat box at any point. We will have Margaret Quasdorf, who we uh, heard from on day one. Margaret will be monitoring the Q&A box to help get any questions asked during the presentations. So up next, we have feed bunk management and we have Casey Havakis from the North Country Regional Ag Team that's gonna be leading us through that section. I think I got control of the screen. So thank you, Betsy. Um, as Betsy mentioned, my name is Casey Havakis. I am one of the dairy management specialists on the North Country Regional Ag Team. And today I will be presenting this portion of feeder school with Dave Balbian, who is a dairy specialist on the Central New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops Team. So in this portion of feeder school, we're going to go over feed bunk management and things that we're going to talk about include communication, maximizing dry matter intake, feeding behavior, and using feeding behavior to maximize dry matter intake, 
grouping strategies, and managing for refusals. So to kick it off, we're gonna to briefly touch on the feeder's role as it relates to communication with others. So the first point I wanna make here is that even with the title feeder, you are not just the feeder. Your role overlaps with many areas on the farm, including the herdsman, the owner, and the nutritionist. And good communication between those roles really creates a sense of team that will bring the farm better results. So over the next few slides, we're going to, just, to discuss some key areas of communication within each of these roles and the feeder. So first, the cows. So obviously you can't communicate with the cows directly, but you can communicate on their behalf. And there are some important things that you should be communicating to the herds person that you're observing from the cows. So things like odd cow behavior. So maybe if they're licking salt blocks a lot, or if they're eating at a particular end of the bunk, or another one is if you see cows licking another cow's urine, those are all things that should be communicated. Also sorting behavior, and if all of a sudden you see a, an abnormally high or low amount of feeding refusals. And then a couple of other things to directly communicate with the herdsmen are cow changes. So if they're moving in and out of a pen or if cow numbers are changing, um, the time when feed needs to be delivered. So when cows are coming back from being milked, it's really important that you work with the herdsmen in that aspect. And then on the same note, when is it a hassle to have feed delivered? So when cows are moving across the feed alley for milking, that's not going to be a good time to have feed delivered and it's just gonna result in inefficiency. So communicating that's really important. And then lastly, issues in the bunk. So if you have frozen feed, moldy feed, improper mixing, things like that. So next, things to communicate with the owner, so grain and forage inventories and problems with either of those. So make sure you let them know if you're running out of a certain feed, problems with equipment, safety concerns, and as I just said, if they need to order feed. And then lastly, things to communicate with the nutritionist. So the length of chop of hay or straw, and that's going to directly relate to the sorting that you see at the bunk. Any types of mixing issues or grain flow issues, again, any types of odd cow behavior, refusal rates, um, if cows are displaying some weird eating behaviors, and then if the bunk is empty for an extended period of time. So all in all, communication really is a two-way street, and in order to see success, all parties must be on the same page. So when you play with variables or assume that something's communicated, when it, maybe it isn't, that's just going to lead to lost opportunities, and that might look like limits on milk output, higher feed costs, and health issues. So at the end of the day, working together is just going to make everybody's day and the results better for the farm. All right, so moving on to maximizing dry matter intake. So Rick Grant likes to talk about feeding behavior and cows eating as a dining experience. And a lot of his presentations, he uses the analogy of perfecting the cow's dining experience. So in a perfect world, the cow will be able to eat when she wants, eat without competition and lie down comfortably after she eats. So really, the ultimate dining experience encompasses all aspects of a cow's physical, social, and feeding environment. Now, there are many ways that we can improve the dining experience, and that includes things like making sure the TMR is properly mixed, which is going to result in uniform feed delivery. Making sure that feed is pushed up all the time, which is going to make sure that the cows constantly have access to the feed and making sure that they have adequate bunk space so that there's not a lot of competition and that's going to allow them to eat comfortably when they want and then rest com comfortably when they want. But there are also a lot of ways that we can hurt the dining experience and that includes things like poorly mixed TMR, which is going to result in feed that is not uniformly delivered. An empty feed bunk or a bunk where cows can't reach the feed is going to hurt her dining experience and if there's limited bunk space, or maybe you just have a really high stocking density, there's going to be a lot of competition, which is going to hurt the dining experience, and that may actually also hurt the time that she is able to rest. Okay, so moving on to feeding behavior. So there are very there are a lot of aspects of feeding behavior, which you can see on this graph here. So you have meal length, feeding time, feeding rate, meal size, and meal frequency. And so total dry matter intake can be expressed as a function of the frequency of meals divided by the meals or multiplied by the meal size, 
or it can be expressed as a function of total feeding time multiplied by the feeding rate. So really that just goes to show you that in order for a cow to increase her dry matter intake, she needs to adjust some aspect of her feeding behavior. And we're gonna go over a few of those strategies in the following slides. But before we do that, I just wanted to point out um, some research that was done quite a few years ago, but still very relevant, where 47 herds were fed the exact same diet. And it was found that 56% of the variation in observed milk production between those herds was explained by non-dietary factors. So things like presence or absence of feed refusals, stocking density, and feed access if it was pushed up or not. So that's a huge amount of variation that's explained by something that isn't even related to the nutrition or the diet itself. So manipulating these characteristics of feeding behavior is a really important part of driving dry matter intake for your cows. So how can we maximize intake by promoting these favorable, favorable feeding behaviors? Well, there are a couple of strategies that we're gonna go over and some of these include encouraging more frequent and smaller meals throughout the day so that cows aren't slug feeding and they aren't upsetting their rumen. By reducing sorting, so this is going to not only help the cow's rumen but also help her consume a balanced diet and if she's spending less time sorting, then she has more time to actually eat and you could even drive dry matter intake higher. And lastly, in cow encouraging cows to stand longer after milking. So we know that TMR delivery acts as the primary motivating factor for cows to consume feed. So some research that was done and summarized by Trevor DeVries in a recent research article stated that when cows were fed once a day, they have large peaks in feeding activity immediately following feeding. And that's to be expected, right? We know that fresh feed is motivating, they're gonna get up and eat. However, having that very large peak in feeding immediately after the feed is delivered could predispose the cows to subacute ruminal acidosis. And this is just because once they have that really large meal, they're going to have um, a lot of rapidly fermentable carbohydrates and that's going to depress the rumen pH. And that's going to be even more amplified if cows are sorting and they're picking out the long forage particles and just going for the grain component. So it was shown that when you feed two times a day or more, it's going to promote more evenly spaced feeding events throughout the day, which is not only going to improve her rumen pH but it also has the opportunity to increase dry matter intake because they're having more meals. And then it also improves the feeding opportunities for those subordinate cows. So maybe once the dominant cows go and have their snack, they're not concerned about eating all at once. So they'll go and lie down and then some of your subordinate cows can go up and have a snack. Okay, so the second thing we can do to promote more desirable feeding behaviors is pushing up feed. So pushing up feed frequently throughout the day ensures that cows always have access to their feed. So presumably that means that they have the opportunity to increase their dry matter intake if they want to. So pushing up feed more frequently is also associated with an increased lying duration. So this is thought because cows are going to be spending less time waiting for their feed, they might just go and lie down instead. It's going to result in less sorting opportunities. So the act of pushing up the feed is going to help mix the feed up and um, just kind of get rid of any sorting holes that those cows may have already had. It also has the potential to optimize production and it's going to minimize the variation in TMR consumed. And that goes back to the point, or that goes back to the sorting point that I just mentioned. So there are two ways that you can assess how good of a job you're doing at your push up frequency. So the first is to look at neck injuries. So cows are really motivated to eat feed. And actually, so, so Rick Grant and some of his research showed that a cow will willingly exert more than 500 pounds of pressure against a feed barrier just to get feed, even though it's been shown that only 225 pounds of exerted pressure can cause tissue damage. So they're willing to hurt themselves to get feed. So it's really important that they don't have to do that and that we're providing feed to them in a way that they can access it. Um, so looking at their necks and seeing if there's any swollen parts on it or if there's any hair loss, that can be a really good way of um, assessing your push-up frequency. A second way is just to look at how your cows react. So even though pushing up the feed is 
a sign that they should eat. Feed push-ups should not have the same stimulatory effect of feed delivery. So if you push up the feed and every single one of your cows gets up from lying down and runs to the feed bunk, that's a very good sign that you need to be pushing up feed more frequently, that cows are hungry and that they've gone too long without access to feed. So there are lots of methods of feed push-ups. So you have your robotic versions, you have your skid steers or some tire or some tractors with tires, or you just have your good old manual broom. So no matter what method works for your farm, there are options. And I can't stress enough the importance of making sure that cows always have access to their feed. All right, so here's a video that we will play. Feeder tips, pushing up feed. After properly mixing feed to create a consistent TMR, we need to make sure that cows eat that consistent ration at the feed bunk. Eating an inconsistent ration can negatively affect cows' health and milk production. Follow a schedule to feed cows around the same time every day. Right after milking is ideal because the cows are already up and will tend to eat more. If feed from the previous day is still present, remove this first so that cows aren't put off by the smell. Distribute feed evenly so that all cows have access to a consistent ration. Push up feed regularly throughout the day and night so cows have access to feed at all times. Cows will naturally push feed away from themselves and sort it as they eat. Pushing up feed every one to two hours, day and night, is ideal. Sometimes cows prefer to eat at specific locations, so feed should also be redistributed when pushing it up. Keeping fresh feed in front of your cows all the time will help them to reach their full potential. All right, so that brings us to our first scorecard question. So if you guys just want to keep track of this, um, give yourself a five if you're pushing up feed more than eight times a day, a three if you're between four and eight times a day, a, a one if you're three times a day or less, and a zero if you never push up your feed. So go ahead and write that down and that will be the first of your scorecard questions for today's session. All right, and the last point I wanna make in relation to feeding behavior is the timing of feed delivery. So encouraging cows to stand following milking is recommended from an utter health standpoint. And it's been shown that when cows lie down in the first 40 to 60 minutes after milking, they have lower odds of a new intramammary infection compared to cows that lie down within 40 minutes of milking. So making sure that they have feed available, if you can't deliver it after milking, just making sure they have it available is really important. And that can be as simple as pushing up feed. And not only is it beneficial from an utter health standpoint, but we also know that milking serves as a motivating factor for them to eat. So having um, feed in front of them and even fresh feed in front of them could also drive higher intakes for those cows. All right, so I will pass it over to Dave and he will talk to us a little bit about grouping strategies. I have two questions here that pertain to your section, Casey. If we want to answer those now. Um, the first question is, um, is there a study on the costs of feeding two times versus one time per day? I believe, I don't think that that study by DeVries looked at the economics of it. They did mention obviously the labor portion of it. I can look at that again, Jake, and um, get back to you with some of those specifics. Okay, and then we have a second question. Um, does the number of feed deliveries count as push-ups? I would say yes. Dave, do you want to add to that? Yes, I, I was. I would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, having you know, and then that kind of goes on my point of feed push-ups help distribute the the feed and help make it more uniform and kind of mix it up a little bit. So deliver 
and feed is another way of making sure that cows are having access to a uniform diet and um, that it's constantly available to them. So I would say yes. Okay, is that, uh, is that um, We also have one more question. Um, when is the best time to deliver feed in robot barns? That's a really good question. So I think I, and I'm not a robotic barn expert. I do think though that from a feeding behavior standpoint, cows are, I'm probably gonna butcher the way this word is supposed to sound, but they're crepuscular animals. So it means that they like to eat at dawn and at dusk. So timing feed delivery in those robotic barns to match the cow's natural feeding behavior, if they were out in the wild or if they were grazing, um, could be beneficial. And I'm Betsy, Dave, Alicia, anyone else, Margaret on the call, if you guys wanna to add to that, feel free. Mar Margaret, I'm thinking you have the most experience with robotic herds. Do you have any thoughts? Margaret? Yeah, I would also agree with Casey that cows are crepuscular and that means that they do like to eat at dawn and dusk. So um, I believe there were some recent studies. I can't remember where I just saw it, but um, shifting the feed time um, to like the nighttime or at a time where cows were not readily wanting to feed um, didn't necessarily show any benefits. So um, kind of working more with the cow schedule as to when they wanna feed according to their feeding behavior probably will be the best option in those robot barns. Yeah, the only thing, the caveat, um, I think there should be more studies on that um, because you think they want to eat at either end of the day, um, like we talk, we're talking about, but if we deliver feed outside of that, are we getting a good bump in dry matter intake because we're putting fresh feed up, doing another push up uh, that gets cows to the bunk and maybe gives those subordinate cows another chance to get some fresh feed. Just another caveat to think about. And then also whether the system is free flow or forced flow, I think that might play a role in your timing of feed delivery. Okay. Let's see if I have control of the screen here. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm going to talk about grouping strategies as it relates to feeding. I also talk about refusals, uh, a lot of different things on different farms to consider. So uh, we'll get right into it here. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is first calf heifers. And I, I, I'm guessing that most of you have heard the story about uh, first calf heifers and how they respond and react when they're co-mingled with, uh, with older cows. So first calf heifers, when you think about their feeding behavior, they eat slower, they take smaller bites, they're more timid, they get pushed around, and it, it takes 10 to 14 days for them to get used to a new environment. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages, if you can, and every farm's a little bit different as far as facilities, cow numbers, et cetera. If you can separate first calf heifers and put them into their own group, uh, they will thank you with increased milk production. Uh, no question about it. Um, so when you're mixing these first lactation animals with mature cows, the things that we typically see is about a 10% reduction in dry matter intake. Um, they're gonna lose more body weight in the first 30 days in milk. Uh, they're gonna drink less, they're gonna ruminate less. Uh, some of that uh, behavior is probably gonna relate is going to um, uh, show up as uh, some slug feeding. Uh, so when they do get, are able to get to the feed bunk, they'll probably consume a lot of feed and then not go back there for a while. That certainly can affect uh, milk fat and milk production. There's no question about it. Um, so uh, some real benefits if you can do that. So let's also talk about stocking density and the effects of overcrowding. Um, so we know that cows would rather um, rest than eat. And this is information that uh, Rick Grant at Minor Institute has been working on for years. Uh, so with increased stocking density, we know we have greater aggression and displacements. 
um, time of eating shifts, fewer meals and eating rate increases. Again, as, as those subordinate cows um, are not able to eat when they want to, uh, they, will, they will eat a huge amount of feed when they're able to get up there to the feed bunk and, and certainly greater potential for sorting feed. Um, so again, every situation is a little bit different depending on how often you feed, uh, how often you push up. Uh, some of your subordinate cows may be left with the higher fiber feed um, in addition to the other factors that are, that are in play there. So lots of negatives uh, with overcrowding. And again, the largest effect is on these subordinate cows, uh, also sick cows, lame cows, and, uh, and first calf heifers, as we talked about earlier. So let's think about best practices for grouping strategies as a feeder. Uh, and I guess I would say this certainly can relate um, to the communication aspect of the whole team on the farm, thinking about how things are set up as far as grouping, what are the potentials uh, to make some changes if it looks like there may be some benefits there uh, on a herd-wide basis. Um, so when feeding a mixed parity group or groups with high stocking density, um, you need to communicate with the herds person about how much stocking density we have, um, what your targeted refusal rates are for each group. We, we wanna have that as far as a strategy and a plan on how much feed we wanna have left over. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about how to deal with those refusals and manage that. Um, also talk with the herds person about group and pen changes and uh, what day they occur, because uh, that can result in a cleaned out feed bunk uh, or tons of feed left over. Um, we wanna increase our observation of these higher risk groups um, and we wanna feed for higher, re higher refusal rates in some targeted groups and we'll talk about that. Uh, we wanna feed more frequently and push up feed more frequently. All right, so let's talk about refusals. So why do we feed cows more than they will eat? Uh, why don't we just feed them so that they clean up everything and there's nothing wasted? Feed costs money, uh, not only the grain and the, and the feed that we buy, but it costs us money to produce forages and any homegrown grains as well. Well, there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, and we're gonna get into the economics a little bit. All right, so when we think about performance and intake uh, in a typical high group ration, and I stress the word typical because there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of differences out there, each additional pound of dry matter intake. So many TMRs are, um, you know, run about 50% uh, dry matter. So that would be uh, for each additional pound of dry matter intake, that would be two pounds as fed per cow per day. But the nutrition that's in that pound of dry matter can equate to two and a half to three pounds of additional milk if you assume that all of the nutrients went into milk production. Now that doesn't always happen and we cannot always predict how cows will partition nu nutrients. Uh, so it can go into milk production. Um, for our first calf and second lactation animals, it can go into growth. Uh, it can also reduce some negative energy balance. So cows may not pull as much body condition. And, and also for later uh, lactation animals or animals that are pregnant, uh, pregnancy has a demand as well. Um, but if it all went into milk production, just think about it. Each pound of dry matter is worth two and a half to three pounds of additional milk. That's unbelievable. And economically, that's a tremendous benefit. So how do we manage these refusals? And uh, I put the word orts in there because um, we oftentimes hear people talk about orts, managing orts. And uh, when I first heard the word, I thought, what are people talking about? So orts and refusals are basically can be used interchangeably. So orts, the word orts, its origin is a late Middle English. It comes from Middle Low German, ort, and it basically means food remains. It's originally a compound of what the second element is related to eat. Um, so anyway, when you think about refusals or if somebody mentions the word orts, uh, it's basically the same thing. Two different words meaning the same thing. So how do we manage these refusals? 
All right, so it's gonna be farm dependent, but there should be a plan. It shouldn't be just, it ends up being whatever it happens to come out to on that day. We need to measure them. Uh, not that we need to measure it every day or every week, but every so often from a standpoint of, of knowing how much weight we have and how we can judge based on bucket loads, skid steer buckets or what have you. Uh, and if there's a significant quantity that's gonna be refed to some other animals, we may, need, we may want to send in a sample uh, to get an idea what the nutrient content is, because uh, that can play a significant role in these other groups. So how do the economics come into play? Well, as I said earlier, wasted feed wastes money, but limiting dry matter intake because of feed not being available can limit milk production, which also limits income. So the most important thing when you think about the economics of feeding cows is, is, is not always just looking at the cost, it's looking at the milk income that's left over after feed costs are paid for. And that's the most important thing. So let's, let's look at an example here from an economic standpoint. And your numbers may be different here, but based on today's prices, this wouldn't be too uncommon from the feed cost standpoint. So assume that your TMR, your total mixed rations, so that's your forages, your grains, everything mixed together, that every pound of dry matter, and again, if it's 50% moisture, the TMR, that's gonna be basically two pounds as fed. So let's assume that it's 13 and a half cents per pound of dry matter is what the feed cost is. So on a 500 cow dairy, each pound of dry matter intake cost $24,637 a year. So basically it's the cost of that pound of dry matter at 13 and a half cents times 500 cows times 365 days in the year. So that's a lot of money, okay? Um, so the flip side of it is the value of the extra milk if we're able to achieve that. So let's pick a number and there's been a lot of volatility in the milk price and we need to think about what our net milk price is after hauling, uh, after uh, co-op, dues, advertising, all those other things. So let's say that our net milk price is 17.50 a hundred weight. So that comes out to 17 and a half cents per pound of milk. So on 500 cows, an extra pound of milk. So I'm just saying, for our example here, let's just say that extra pound of feed intake only netted us one pound of milk. The rest of it went somewhere else from a standpoint of body condition or growth or what have you, okay? So if we um, multiply that out, just like we did the feed cost, that extra pound of milk is worth almost $32,000. So you can see if we are able to achieve an additional pound of feed intake, and we get only one pound of milk. In this case here, we would have a net benefit of what? Uh, 70, about $7,500 a year, okay? And just think if we could drive intake up by a couple of pounds and we can get a pound and a half or two pounds of extra milk for every pound of dry matter. So it's pretty important to maximize feed intake on these cows and drive that intake. Um, so it's easy to see why this can pay some pretty big dividends. Um, so we don't want to waste feed or overfeed um, feed, uh, but we don't want to limit dry matter intake. The feed bunks should ideally never be empty, but no greater than two hours, a, you know, anything greater than two hours a day in a 24 hour period is problematic. And remember, it's not just the fact that, um, you know, feed isn't there, but if it's out of reach. So if basically there's feed there, but none of the cows can reach it, you might as well call it empty from a standpoint of, of uh, looking at this situation. So what should our goals be for refusals? Okay, and this information actually, I, I did a search, kind of looking at my own uh, biases, but also uh, looking at some information that came from a lot of different sources. Uh, and actually our, our, one of our, our speakers later this afternoon, Dr. Bill Stone, uh, put a lot of uh, uh, this together in uh, what's called Dairy Next, a consideration feed bunk management. Uh, so here's, here's some ideas to, to start with. And, and again, this can vary based on your management philosophies and practices.
But the one thing for sure is we wanna do everything we can to maximize dry matter intake in these cows. So here's some guidelines um, and industry goals and guidelines. Fresh cows, okay? They're pretty vulnerable, lots of potential there, three to 5% if we have a fresh cow group. High cow groups, one to 5%. Late lactation or low cow groups, a half to 3%, okay? So what do we do with these refusals, okay? So do we discard them? So if you manage this really tight and you can basically, these, these low refusal rate herds are more likely to take this approach. Um, but again, be really careful that you're not limiting dry matter intake. Uh, you need to be pretty sharp and you need to be monitoring things very, very closely every day. So the other question is, can we refeed these to other animals? Well, we certainly can. So there's some, some cautions and some concerns. We wanna think about Yoni's disease, if we're gonna be feeding these to younger animals. Um, we wanna think about overconditioned animals, if we're feeding a lot of refusals to animals that have a low energy demand, uh, maybe such as uh, yearling heifers. Uh, we also wanna think about mineral imbalances and other things. So again, you need to work with your nutritionist and your team uh, to kind of take a look at all of these uh, issues um, to figure out what's the best situation for you. Okay, again, lots of choices. So some people will say they're gonna feed for 5% refusals and refeed to all lactation groups except the fresh cows. And again, you should be analyzing those refusals. We're gonna feed it maybe to older heifers. And again, the concern for Yoni's disease is there. Um, we have uh, alleyways and trafficking, or basically we're going across the feed alley and manure getting across there. So that's a concern or an issue to think about from the standpoint of how you manage that. Far off dry cows, maybe another potential. Uh, late lactation or low groups. And the last one here for people that uh, can make this work is steers. Um, Basically, they, they kind of get the leftovers after our dairy cows have uh, really kind of had their first dibs on things. So I guess one thing to say is that some common sense is needed here. If you, you need to discard hot, slimy, and stinky feed, uh, if it's only sticks, long stalks, and weeds. So a little bit of finesse and a little bit of uh, judgment goes a long way from the standpoint of how we manage these, uh, these refusals or orts. So here's a scorecard uh, section for you, okay? As it relates to refusals or orts. If you have a plan for orts and cows never or rarely run out of feed, give yourself a five. If you have a plan for orts or one, and one or two groups run out of feed once a month, give yourself a three. If you try to have to not have cows run out of feed, but it happens three to four times a month, give yourself a one. If you don't worry about refusals and cows only run out of feed a few times every week, give yourself a zero. Okay, again, remember, we're trying to maximize dry matter intake. And our goal is not so much to save feed and save feed costs, it's to maximize the economics from a standpoint of what's left over from an economic standpoint. In other words, what's our feed cost? What's the value of the milk and how much money is left over? And driving intake can drive production, which improves that situation. Okay, so in summary, communication between the feeder and other key members of the farm operation is critical for success. Um, you need to pay attention to key feeding behaviors and try to implement management strategies that promote good feeding behaviors. After all, feeding behavior drives dry matter intake. And that's really one of the big, big things that we're, we're driving at here and, and uh, is extremely important. How cows are grouped will have a direct impact on feeding behavior, intake and overall performance. And feeding for the right amount of refusals is dependent on management, grouping strategy, Regardless, cows should never be out of feed for more than, more than two hours in a 24 hour period. And again, 
It's not just that there's feed there. If they can't reach it, you might as well consider it not available, okay? All right, so our scorecard recap. Uh, so Casey covered the first part of it. There's a maximum of 10 points here. Uh, again, feed push-ups. Um, five, if you push up and feed more than eight times a day. Three, if you push up and feed between four and eight times a day. A one, if you push up, feed three times or less per day. And a zero, if you never push up feed. And I guess I would say, you certainly don't see this um, hardly anymore, but there are some old feed bunks where basically cows could reach feed all the time. Uh, they're pretty tough to keep clean, um, but take that into account as you're scoring yourself. If you have a feed bunk situation uh, where basically the cows can't push the feed away, um, you know, you need to temper your scorecard for that feed push-up. Uh, refusals, and we just talked about that. Um, if basically uh, you've got a plan, cows never or rarely run out of feed, give yourself a five. If you have a plan, but cows do, one or two groups run out of feed once a month, give yourself a three. Uh, if you try not to have cows run out of feed, but it happens three to four times a month, a one. And if you don't worry about it, you just kind of shoot from the hip and cows run out of feed a few times every week. Well, you get zero for that one. Okay, so here's our feeder challenge question, uh, our first one. So list three strategies for maximizing dry matter intake. And I'll give you folks a, a few moments here to type in uh, to the uh, Q&A or the chat um, what all of those could be. I see some people putting some numbers in from a standpoint of their scorecard. Okay, we're gonna move on to feeder challenge number two. Okay, so at the end of the day, we're gonna go over these, but here's, here's feeder challenge number two. Your nutritionist said the feed bunks goes empty too often and he thinks refusals are too low. We say he, it should be he or she feels that you're giving up two to three pounds of milk per cow per day. So if you got 300 cows going into the tank and you're giving up two pounds of milk per cow per day and milk is worth $17 a hundredweight, what is that milk worth over a year's period of time? All right, I'll give you a moment here to maybe jot down some notes here if you uh, wanna work on it a little bit later here. Um, but again, your nutritionist thinks refusals are too low, thinks you're giving up two to three pounds of milk per cow per day, 300 cows going in the tank, let's assume two pounds and milk's worth $17 a hundred weight. Over the course of a year, what is that milk worth? Okay. All right, and questions. Yep. So Dave, we have um, we had one question in the chat box that asked about um, what we should do with our refusals. And I know you went over it in the slides right after the question was asked, but can you just review um, what we can do with our refusals quickly? Okay, all right. So again, depending on um, your individual situation, the one I like best is because basically it's not recycling any of that feed back to our milking groups is to feed it to other livestock, to some steers or some other animals. So we're still getting some value out of that. Uh, but certainly it can be refed to, uh, to, uh, to heifers, maybe far off dry cows and again, those choices and decisions really should be made as a team from a standpoint of, of uh, what you're shooting for as far as refusals. That'll give you an idea of, uh, 
um, well, I shouldn't say that'll give you an idea. If you send it into the lab and get an analysis and you do that a few times to kind of get an idea, um, it'll help you to kind of determine maybe where those refusals can go, the best use of them. Um, so a lot of different places. And again, some common sense, uh, we don't wanna be kind of recycling so much feed that we just are contaminating that new TMR, especially for our animals that are gonna be most vulnerable, our fresh cows, our first calf heifers, uh, the animals that uh, we really wanna to strive to maximize dry matter intake on. Okay, any other questions? Yes, we have some more questions. Um, what's the recommended refusals level for close-up cows? Close-up cows. Um, and I guess I didn't touch on that. That's a good question. Um, I'd have to look to see if there's any kind of industry guidelines out there. But I would say we want to be thinking about a higher level, um, probably like 5%. Um, that's an important group. One of the things in, in every situation, I guess I would say every herd situation can't do this, but we talk about these first calf heifers, separating these first calf heifers. Uh, and oftentimes we, we put these first calf heifers in prior to calving in with our close-up cows. If, if you have a large enough herd, if you have the facilities, if you have the ability to basically separate those first calf heifers in their own pre-fresh group, that can benefit those animals as well. Um, that's not answering that specific question that you asked, but I guess I would say I'd be shooting for around 5% or so. Uh, certainly a higher level, uh, a really important group and a vulnerable group that we wanna be sure um, they have an opportunity to maximize their intake. Anybody else have, a, have some thoughts, Casey? Yeah, um, again, not a direct answer to the question in terms of a value of feed refusals, but you really don't want to restrict your close-up cows and in intake. So making sure that they always have a good supply of feed is really important. But the only downside to that is making sure that your energy density of the feed is appropriate so that they're not gaining so much body condition score that they're going to have metabolic issues afterwards. So it's kind of it's kind of a, a really tricky balancing act, making sure that the cow can eat as much as she wants while also not gaining too much body condition. And that's where those controlled energy dry cow diets come into play. So um, yeah, just very important that your close cows aren't running out of feed. Yeah, good good point. And I guess the other thing too is, uh, is bunk space and overcrowding. Uh, we don't wanna overcrowd these uh, pre-fresh animals. In fact, we wanna, we wanna undercrowd um, those groups from a standpoint of stalls and feed box space. And that can vary a lot depending on if the herd doesn't calve evenly throughout the year, uh, it can cause you some issues, but. So anyway. Um, Sounds go good. Um, if you wanna go, we're gonna go over the scores. We have a question here. How do you score if the bunk is half empty or totally empty? And we'll go over um, the scores again at the end. And then one other quick question. Um, regarding robots again, but anybody can jump in with their thoughts. Um, should we feed cows in a robot barn when we have fresh, or when we fetch cows so that we are also using um, robot time uh, when other cows are at the bunker? So should we fetch our cow, should we have fetch cows waiting to be milked? At the same time, we're feeding so that we're taking advantage of when all the cows go up to the bunker that we're not losing milk time, I think, is what the question is trying to get at. Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, so let me think this through again. So the question is, basically, should we have fresh feed after we've, we've, we've done our fetch cows, we've put them, we've locked them up so they have to go through the, uh, uh, through the robot, and do we put fresh feed down at that time? So that's an, another encouragement for them to go through. Is that kind of the gist of it? I think, um, I mean, that might be another good point to talk about, but I think it is more, should we, should we feed cows in the robot barn when we fetch cows so that we use robot time when cows are constrained at the bunker? So, 
sure if I'm really following the question quite right. Margaret, you're our you're our well, expert. Um, from what I can understand about the question, I think they're asking, should we have cows also milking? Should we fetch cows so that there are cows milking at the same time as as cows are being fed, so we can maximize our time in the box in the box, um, while most cows will go up to the bunk. Um, in that case, I guess it would depend on how those cows in in the fetch pen react to all the other cows going out uh, up for the feed and how long those cows might have been without feed. Um, I wouldn't want them to be stressed out if there was no feed in the bunker and trying to get to the feed source. But if they're okay being there, I think they could go through and then come out and be fed again. But um, I think at this point, we're gonna move forward to our mixer wagon management section. Okay. All right, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Bill Stone. Uh, he works for Diamond V and he has helped gobs of farms across the Northeast help to dial into improving their mixer wagon management, troubleshooting, um, TMRs, doing TMR audits um, all across the Northeast. So welcome Dr. Bill Stone. Hello everyone, I'm Bill Stone, and today we're going to talk about a very interesting and important topic, and that is going to be mixer wagon management. And I, I think one thing that's interesting, we think about our milking and feeding systems on our dairies, and really often for our milking systems, we really have things monitored. And we work on things, for example, having a good specific milker routine and training for milkers if they're a new milker or, or an old milker just making sure they're doing things the way we want it to be done equipment is typically evaluated regularly making sure that vacuum levels right where we want and all those pulsators are working well, et cetera. There's maintenance that has to be done. Liners have to be changed. A water heater has to be kept. So that's getting water up to the proper temperature. We have our vacuum regulator, of course, that has to be cleaned and maintained. And typically, I see most dairies working on this area, some, some better than others, but they're working on it. Versus with our feeding system, really often it's simply well, if the cows have feed, everything's operational, we're, we're in business. And something that we started uh, many years ago now in our Diamond V technical services team was working with these TMR audits. And what they're really designed to do was to develop a system so that we could evaluate the feeding system, similarly to how we try to evaluate the milking system. And what I want to share with you today is just the main things that we've learned in terms of factors that can influence that performance of the mixer wagon. And we try to get all of our information on, on the dairy upon the, the day of our visit. And to evaluate a load from a mixer wagon, say that this fellow came along here and just unloaded feed all along the length of this pen here. And then in this example, I went along and every, uh, every, 10% of that bunk length, we collected a sample of that TMR. And we want to evaluate that feed as it's come off the mixer wagon. So for example, if this feeder went back and forth and back and forth four times, ideally we'd get two and a half samples from each of those passes. Or if it was one pass uh, from one end to the other, then we could easily come along here and collect these 10 samples. Because we want to see what that TMR is like these 10 different points along the bunk, and we want it to be as consistent as possible. The reason that's really important is that what we, we've learned, and we mean meaning the dairy industry, we've learned that cows typically eat within a region of this bunk. And if it's, a, if it's a lockup, they often eat in essentially that same lockup, very similar to that same area. What that means is, of course, that that cow doesn't go along and eat 
a couple bites all along this whole length of the bunk, making sure that she gets a good distribution to feed through that TMR, she eats in one area. And that's why it's important that that TMR in every one of these areas is just as it was supposed to be according to that ration. So that's our goal. Minimize that variation between the formulated and the consumed ration. Have a really good consistent ration along the whole length of this bunk. This is an example of a prefresh diet where we, we really wouldn't have to do a sophisticated analysis. We could look at it and see, boy, I can see that there's big clumps of hay here that aren't thoroughly mixed in. But still, we went along and grabbed a sample from 10 points along here and then ran them through the Penn State particle separator. And this then, for those of you that have worked with that simple screening system, is the long material retained on the top screen, this is what was, what was retained on the middle screen or the fines that went through to the pan. And the fines are essentially, that's where the grain is at. And this will be some smaller pieces of forage, maybe a whole corn kernel. Still, there, there won't be small pieces of, of grain here. They will have passed through. And this, of course, is long forage particles, sometimes some cotton seed if it gets hung up on this top screen. <clears throat> Well, this is the TMR we just looked at, and here's our samples from 1 through 10, and then the average. This is the percent that was on that top screen, or the middle, or the pan for that first sample, and then similarly all the way along here. And let's just look, for example, at the middle screen in red. Again, we want this to be a straight line, because we want it to be consistent along this bunk, and obviously, this is not a straight line. We've got variation there. And we again, we saw that when we looked at it, but it's not always as visible as the example that we just observed. We're going to look at a measure of variation around this. These are all the means. So measure of var variation around each of these means. So this red mean is right here on 30. And as we go along here, if we sum up each of these deviations, their distance away from the mean here, that essentially is this coefficient of variation, or CV, that we'll be looking at in terms of giving us a measure of how consistent these loads are, or this particle size distribution is in this example. Well, this is the, the farm that we're just looking at, In this bottom one here is a prefresh diet, and this is the average on the top screen, here's three lactating cow loads, and then this prefresh cow load, and it's CV. And the middle screen, and it's CV. And finally, the bottom screen, and it's CV. We focus primarily on these CVs for the middle screen and the pan. And the reason for that really is that, as you can see here, some loads of TMR, they don't have much on the top screen. And to have a consistent recommendation for what this number should be in terms of the CV, it will vary based on how big this, this number is here. Okay, so because this varies quite a bit, we focus more on the middle screen and the pan. Our goal is to be less than 2.5% for um, both of these middle screens and pan. And you can see for most of these lactating cow loads, we're close. We're not quite there. The prefresh load, we're way out of the ballpark. And again, the problem there was this hay was not processed properly. It was clumped together. It needed to be chopped shorter and totally mixed in with the TMR. But that's how the process works. This is an example of another TMR. You can see much, much more consistent. Other than this very first sample, it's pretty much, those are almost perfectly straight lines. That's what we want to see. That's a cow coming up here. Any point along this whole bunk, she's going to get the same TMR. And so that's, that's our goal, good, consistent TMR. And then these are the CVs from the load we just looked at from this, this dairy. We've got three, two lactating cow loads and the fresh pen load. You can see even on this top screen here, this, this farm 16 to 18% on the top screen with these relatively small CVs, but then really good CVs for this middle screen and pan, less than two here for the middle, less than 2.4 for the pan. Again, very good, consistent ration. In terms of what we see out there, we see things getting better. We, we see our industry improving. But still, it's probably around 20 to 25 percent of TMRs really hit that excellent of having CVs less than two and a half percent for the middle screen and pan, and that means basically you're doing a good job. Okay, so we're 
things we're going to be talking about today, you're going to see they're, they're in place and being done properly in this situation. If those CBs are less than 4%, we're probably now to our top 50% of our TMRs, and we're going to try to do better, but it's unclear if we're going to see a visible improvement in cow performance if we go from a 3.8 to a 2, for example. But as that variation increases more and more, we typically have seen increases in performance if it's production or milk fat percent or fewer cases of indigestion, for example, as we go from this less consistent diet to this much more consistent TMR. Now, one thing I want you to think about, just a basic little premise here, is that feed particles mix when they're falling together at the same time. So picture all these different varied size particles in the TMR when they're falling together at the same time now, those big ones and medium-sized ones and small ones can mix together so we get this consistent ration that we want. Any ingredient or process that interferes with that falling and mixing action can affect TMR consistency. Let me show you this really basic TMR. It's really basic TMR. All this guy has done is he has a, a scale on their loader bucket. They weight up the amount of each ingredient and they're picking it up and turning it over multiple times here. There's those feed particles falling together at the same time. They're going to do that multiple times and it's going to be loaded into a delivery wagon and unloaded to the pan of cows. This is what we just saw. Here's mixed with that payloader, turning the pile five times, put into a delivery box and taken to the dairy. And that's about as consistent as you can get. I'm not saying don't use a mixer wagon, okay? What I'm saying is we, that falling action is really important. And no doubt that delivery box did some mixing as it was unloaded as well. Here's a twin screw vertical wagon, really good numbers. Horizontal auger wagon, pretty darn good. You can see a little bit of a, a decrease in this middle screen, a little increase in that bottom as we unloaded here. And I'll give you a, a big reason why when we talk about horizontal augers in a little bit here. But my point is, you can get a really good mix with any wagon that's out there. What's going to be important is these 10 factors right here. They're going, to, they're going to make the difference in terms of if you're getting that really good, consistent mix, or you're going to have a TMR with too much variation. So we're going to run through these different uh, points here, and I'll just give you examples of how they can really influence that consistency of the TMR. So the equipment maintenance. First one, everybody, all you feeders out there, you have the book for your mixer wagon. If you don't, get it. Okay, so review that book. What are you supposed to be doing for maintenance on it? And, and do it. Another important one is just look in the mixer wagon. You should do that on a daily basis. Look in there. Is there any twine wrapped around anything? Any tire jammed in there? Big log that got stuck in there? Anything you don't know about? Piece of concrete? So look in there and make sure there's not something in there that shouldn't be there or anything visibly broken. I wanted you to just kind of ask yourself, is that maintenance program on your mixer wagon as rigorous as a program for your milking equipment? If not, why not? Because this piece of equipment is, is as important as your milking parlor. So maintain it just like you would your milking parlor. In terms of where the primary wear points on different mixers for a vertical mixer, it's going to be this kicker plate, which we'll look at. It can be the auger, the mixer tub, or knives if you're using them. For horizontal auger mixers, it's the augers typically and the tub. And finally, for horizontal auger reels, it's the augers, the tub, and of course, the reel itself. So those are the, big, the biggies. This was actually the first TMR audit I ever did many, many years ago on the dairy and no, state south of here. I won't say more than that. But finished, they delivered this load of feed. The feeder came back to uh, make the next load. And this is how much feed was left in the mixture wagon. And here's just some little things. Well, that, that's a concern right there, right? This was a lot of feed that was left over. But other little things we can get an idea of. If you guys have a vertical mixer and you look at it, that metal should be thick. These are real heavily, um, ruggedly built augers. You can see that one is thin. Another point is, this is my old BlackBerry phone. It's about three inches wide. 
And look at this big distance between, this is the leading edge of this auger and that wall. So it's three inches. There's supposed to be something called this kicker plate right here. And we'll look at that in just a moment, but it's not there, it's gone. And that was because the, the people didn't realize that it was mandatory. They thought it was optional. The only way, reason it's optional is if you don't want a good mix on your feed, then it would be optional. We don't want that, so it's mandatory. Well, this is from a Supreme mixer wagon. Here's a worn kicker plate, and here it is replaced now. We want this to be as close to the wall, essentially, usually about three to an inch or so, half an inch, the closest point to the wall as this moves around the whole mixer wagon. These things aren't perfectly engineered, so that space will vary, but make it so it's hopefully you know, darn close as it moves along here. Its job is it's acting kind of like a plow. It's plowing share feed from this wall of the wagon, bringing it to the center so the feed that's moving up from the auger has a spot to come down. This volcanic action can be occurring, and these feed particles can be moving and falling together at the same time and mixing. Okay, so this is a critical piece of equipment to bring this feed in so there's room for it to have this movement that is important for mixing. Well, this is that mixer wagon we looked at with that missing kicker plate. And looking at it from this picture, it looks pretty darn good, right? It's got a good paint job on it, good paint job on the truck. But if we head up here, we need that. We head here and look side this mixer wagon. Now, this is an important thing. This is a great thing for you to do. Safely, carefully look into this mixer wagon when it has when your mixer wagon, a big load of feet on it. And does it look like it's mixing properly? So I asked you, does it look like this load is mixing properly? No way, right? We've got this mountain that's not moving here. We don't, that, that's not moving over there. This feed isn't moving. This is just kind of going loop, you know, up and down, but not vigorously moving like we wanted to. Again, remember here, we had really worn augers and we had that missing kicker plate. And the worn auger, that brings those auger, that auger edge farther away from the wall, so it's not mixing this feed well. The kicker plate's gone. It's not bringing feed in, so there's, there's no action going on there like we want at all. Again, this is a big dairy. They, they thought everything was working fine because feed was being delivered to the cows okay. Obviously, it wasn't. This is, again, what we saw. Worn auger, missing kicker plate. This is what their particle size distribution had looked like. Remember, we want that to be a straight line. This obviously is not a straight line. And now I want to show you another mixer wagon. And let's look at this difference here. We want to see this good, vigorous mixing action throughout the entire wagon, one into the other, hopefully all the way to the very front and the very back. We want good movement all along these walls and throughout this load. And again, that's how we're, we're going to get all these different size feed particles to get mixed together. Okay, so that's really good, aggressive mixing action. No dead spots. Now, Here's the particle size distribution from that load of feed. Gorgeous, right? Super good and consistent. And we compare those two mixer wagons. Here's the first one we saw with that missing kicker plate. Interesting thing here. Look at this particle size distribution, 17.8 on this farm. Here's the other farm, 17.7. A little bit more difference in the middle screen and the pan, but their top screen exactly the same. Here's the CV, 36% on that top screen, 4.6 here. Middle screen 11.3 and a 6.2 versus that mixture wagon that was doing such a good job, a 1.1 one, one and a 1.2. So this is fantastic. But that's, that's obviously what's achievable. That's how good a job our mixture wagons can do for uh, making that good, consistent ration. All right. Probably the next most common thing we see being done wrong is improper mix time after the last ingredient. And the last ingredient is, after the last ingredient is loaded. It isn't, for example, if you're putting in water or whey, and it takes you three minutes to put the whey in, and you want to do a four-minute mix time, so we mix for one more minute after 
all the way went in. That's wrong. It's three to five minutes after that whey or water was all put in because that has to get completely distributed across all of the rest of the feed. And so we have to use a timer. And often I'll hear a feeder say, well, I know how long it takes me to drive up to the barn and I mix it from, and I put the last load of corn silage in, let's say, and I go in to get a little bit more corn silage and I come back and then I hop on the mixture wagon and it takes me about four minutes. But what if you go to a different barn that's farther away? What if it takes you longer or shorter to go to that last bit of corn silage? And, right? What if it's unlevel as you're traveling from where you're loading to where you're going to be unloading? So all those things really influence it. It's best to use a timer. And all of our feed management software programs have the option that after that last ingredient goes in there, a timer can start. It's just a countdown timer that will show you that amount of time since that last ingredient went in there. And so get that going on your feed management software if you don't have that going. Here's the same mixture wagon with a three and a half minute mix time or a five minute mix time. Here's our CVs. 18.5, 31, and 4.8, down to an 8.2, a 2.1, and 2.6. So one and a half more minutes made for a much more consistent diet. And there's not a set time on this. Is it three minutes or five minutes? It really depends on things like how good a shape is my mixture wagon is in, how full is it, what speed am I running it at. Those are really big things that make a difference in how much time is needed. Okay, load size, another important area. We can see this fellow here is kind of pushing it. A full load of feed, a little bit too full, you might say, since it's coming out the top. We've got a concern about that. This guy, though, he wins the award. But he's says out in Idaho, and it's obviously a full load of feed. I'd say it's a little bit too full of a load of feed. But this feeder is following directions, and the directions calls for a certain amount of hay, and he's going to add that certain amount of hay to this mixture wagon because he wants to make the diet as he was told to make it. So you can see him carefully adding that hay there, trying to get those weights just right. And <laughs> this is a great example of miscommunication, where whoever entered this diet, you know it wasn't the feeder, but whoever entered it, uh, they probably went from a higher density, let's say, haylage to this lower density hay, or the group size increased a lot, and they just increased the uh, numbers that were supposed to have been fed from a load of feed. But a feeder has to communicate back to whoever is controlling this ration, and that load size obviously has to be reduced. Here's a real auger being loaded. It really should be loaded from this side over here over the auger. But remember, those feed particles mix and they're falling together at the same time. This is locked up in a drum. All this stuff inside this big drum isn't getting out of it. It's turning around inside, locked up inside, and it's only a little bit on the outside of this drum that's uh, coming off and mixing. I mentioned with a real auggie, what can lead to that consistent like increase in the middle screen of the pan that we saw in that earlier example. And this is it. It's overloading that real auggie. This is what's most commonly done with the real auggie because I think most people figure, boy, I bought that big box. I want to fill that big box up. But it doesn't work that way. It can only be filled until approximately 75% of that struck full capacity. You have to see this falling again as it's coming around here or else it doesn't mix. The offset um, reels seem like they really do help where you can get a little bit more full and it doesn't lock in that drum as much. And there's really good falling action. This is more of a grain premix. There's some wet brewers in there, so it's very heavy. But you see it falling really well. It's going to be mixing well as that's happening. And here's just an example of same mixture wagon, overfilled. CV is a 7, 4, and a 5, 2. Properly filled. 27 and 26. Okay, so that was no big investment, obviously. Just didn't fill the mixer wagon up as much. And it might be an extra load of feed for the day, but it's going to be a consistent TMR, and that's very important. Okay, levelness of the mixer during loading. Now, this one we can see is really unlevel, right? That looks really bad. But this doesn't look so bad. 
this is one I did this TM audit and I was looking at it and I thought, yeah, it's a little bit on level. And you can see it's on level because this feed's moving forward. Uh, the feeder didn't load it that way, but it's it's um, sloped forward. And so the as it's mixing inside of here, the feed is slowly um, moving forward. Uh, tree leaves do, if they're in good shape, they do a good job of mixing. And this one was in good shape. And I, I thought, I think it will be okay anyway. I, I was wrong. But here's, this is a cow posing here, by the way. But anyway, here's, we, we, this load of feed has been delivered. And we see some haylage clumps. That, that's one thing. They didn't have a defacer on this dairy. And the same ration is fed to um, two first lactation animal groups. And that was a smaller load of feed. And there is some balance here, but not too bad. And we see... Um, a little bit of a difference in this uh, grain component, the green line, but not real bad. But the load that we just saw was for the mature cows. It's a much bigger load, and it feeds two pens. So half of it went to the first pen, that's right here, and the second half went to the second pen. And I want you to follow along with me. Again, here's the grain. Here it is, 40% grain for the first 80% of that bunk. And the last little bit now goes up to 50% grain. We go to the next pen, and those cows got 50% grain. Think about sometimes your, your nutritionist might make a change in the diet. Does uh, do he or she ever change that diet from 40% grain to 50% grain overnight? The answer is they better not, right? We, we, we never want to do that. But here, these cows are being fed the same load of feed, but... It's dramatically different. And that was because it wasn't level. It's amazing. So what they did in this area, they changed the mix order. So the halage went in earlier to help break up that, those clumps, grain mix, corn silage. Mixer was on throughout loading. They modified the hitch leveling adjustments so the mixer could be leveled. Now, boy, that looks a lot better, doesn't it? Looks a lot more consistent. Here's the modification that the the crew did on the dairy so again this could be leveled additional holes here to allow for more adjustment and now here is that load of feed for those mature cows a bigger load number was 40 percent along here and it jumped up to 50 now we're steady there about 46 or 7 and look at the cvs this is the first time we've done it remember that heifer load bounced around a little bit but not too much this was at Cow load with that huge variation. So feed CVs of four and a 10. And then after we made those changes and leveled that mixer wagon, our CV now for the middle screen is only a 1.1 and for the pan a 2.1. Okay, so very little investment, right? You had to do some home manufacturing to get that mixer wagon leveled and we changed the mix order a little bit. And now we have a much more consistent diet. And the cows really should do better. So that was, that was good to see. Loading position in the mixer box. Uh, we don't want to do this, right? This is a dual screw auger. Why load it over one auger and then absolutely count on that auger moving it forward and mixing it throughout this whole feed? It makes a lot more sense to load it over both augers. So pass actually gives you a, there's the target. Aim for that. But any mixer wagon, aim for the center, try to get it over uh, as much of the mixer wagon as you can. It just helps with the mixing action or helps with the likelihood we're going to get a good mix. Okay, hair straw quality and its processing. If you're going to have knives, then count on those knives to process the forage, and the knives have to be kept sharp. That just kind of makes sense. If they get really dull and they're not doing their job, well, they're not going to do their job. And we're going to have too long a forage and we're going to have the issues as that first example that I showed won't mix properly. We've got quite a few of these big hay busters around and they do an excellent job. They do the best job of processing dry, long forage. You don't have to come with this great big grabber here. I'll show you another small one in a minute. But anyway, this does a good job. Roto Grind also does a, a good job. This one does a great job. This is probably a good job. But here's a smaller hay buster. Again, does a very good job on processing this forage. 
If we use our mixture wagon to process our forage, that can be very expensive. Right? You can put a bale of hay in your mixture wagon and you can let it run and run and run. It's increasing the wear on that mixture wagon. It's running full throttle. And so there's a lot of fuel expense in doing that. So these, these pieces of equipment, they're not cheap, but they can really save on the mixture wagon wear and they can do an excellent job. So they're, they can, that can be a very good investment. Okay, loading sequence. Well, that mixing order depends on the mixture wagon type. It depends on the ingredient type. Ingredient type is density, particle size, and dry matter. Inclusion level and convenience. Now, where is that feed located in terms of how I'm getting everything loaded? Ingredient mix order will, depending on uh, how well you mean your equipment is maintained, it makes more or less of a difference in terms of the mix order. You can have things goofed up some if you have your equipment in really good shape. And finally, if we mix longer, even if our order was off a bit, we might be able to compensate for that. So all those things come into play. But in general, our lower density and larger feed particles are loaded first. So for example, our hay or haylage or straw or dry, you know, drier type products would go there first. The exception might be with a real mixture, if you put a great big clump of a in there, a big section, it could potentially jam underneath that reel. So grain might go in first with the reel mixer. But in general, then we start with a lower density. We proceed to our drier, more dense feeds. For example, our dry grains. Any hand ads we're trying to get in here a little bit earlier even. We have to have a hand ad. We go with our wet feeds. For example, our, our corn silage and finally our liquids. With a low inclusion ingredient, ideally that could be included in a premix. Uh, if it can't be included in premix, try to add it when that hand add will make up at least 2% of the load size at that time. Here's an example of a full mixture wagon, and this is some uh, room and bypass fad, and that's being put in here. I'm just gonna get a little bit more energy in this time. I'm gonna add a little bit more fat, and that's not gonna get mixed in there well at all. And so it's not going to get, it's not going to accomplish what we want it to accomplish. Okay, so that, that, would, that should be in a premix or at the least should go in a lot earlier in that load of feed. With liquid distribution, I want to show you a, a herd that had a lot of things going wrong here. We've got four different loads of feed here. And across every one of those loads, for example, here's the middle, the amount of the middle screen here in, in this reddish color. It's decreasing from the front, the middle to the end, front, middle to the end, across every one of these loads of feed. You see the bottom is going up across every one of these loads of feed. Well, they were adding way on one end of the mixer wagon. The mixer truck wasn't level. The TMR is only mixed for one minute or less after the liquid was loaded. And here it is being done. You see that looks good. The answer is it doesn't. Right? It's coming in here in one spot. It looks like it's a different color here. It's not mixing aggressively. That's darker. This is lighter. Uh, very slow movement of this feed. But you can see where this could be a, a big mess, and it was. Well, this one's better. When we look at this. Water is being added. They've got the approximately the back third of this um, horizontal auger. So that's that's Pretty darn good here, getting that water added. But here's way going on, and that's even better, isn't it? You got that. It's kind of like loading this mixer wagon in the in the middle versus on one end. We're getting it across the whole length of that wagon. We're getting everything wetter. It's just it's going to be that much more consistent. So that's just keep that in mind. You sure as heck don't want to put it in one spot. The more can be dispersed, the better. Vertical mixer auger speed. This is, this is important. When you think about those feed particles mixing again when they're falling together at the same time, if that auger is moving extremely slowly, think about an auger turning very, very slowly, and that feed is coming up very, very slowly, and then it's falling very slowly. Well, it's hardly falling at all. Because it's hardly falling, it doesn't mix well. If it's moving faster and faster now, and those feed particles are moving faster, they can fall more and they mix better. 
So that vertical mixture auger speed really makes a difference. This is a little case study where TMR audit had been done, and this is a triple screw pecan. It was mixing at 42 revolutions per minute, which is fast, okay? And here's our small CVs, a 3.1 and 1.8. They heard it as big drop in performance, and they requested another TMR audit, and they didn't think anything had changed until the feeder remembered, actually, we had to get a new gearbox. And first year on this new gearbox, it was a different gearbox, essentially. First year turned at 28 revolutions per minute versus 42 previously. And that made for a much uh, less consistent TMR. They would put it in the second gear, which was very close to the previous speed, 38 revolutions per minute. Again, a super consistent TMR. And they saw this increase in milk production. So you look at milk, energy correct milk, it's saying red, big drop was like 15 pounds, and then an increase. And it went along with components. Think about butter, fat, and protein. They are really influenced by how consistent the rumen is. And that rumen is really influenced by how consistent the ration is. Well, here we are with a consistent ration. We've got a consistent milk fat, consistent protein. But when the ration became inconsistent, we started to see more fluctuation and a decrease in these components. And then again, when the ration was made consistent again, we saw an increase in milk components. So remember, feeders, milk components are what pays the bills on the dairy. So two really important jobs for you. Always do a good job of feeding. One reason you work because the feed is so expensive, but also your performance influences, of course, production, overall production, and production of milk components. Lastly, milk urea nitrogen. Think about that rumen being stable. Milk urea nitrogen it looks at basically the relationship between um, how much nitrogen is needed and available to the rumen microbes. So the, the rumen microbes are fermenting all this carbohydrate and they need nitrogen to grow. Things are really stable to make for a stable um, milk urea nitrogen. But if the ration is really varying in carbohydrate and protein levels, then we're going to have, of course, variation in that rumen. And that leads to the variation in milk urea nitrogens as well. So that's what's seen during this time period. And again, it's stabilized afterwards. My, my colleagues and I, we looked at a bunch of different mixer wagons where this is the average CV for the middle screen and pan when that mixer wagon was operated essentially at a slower speed or a faster speed for the same number of revolutions. And then we looked at those CVs and you can see every time when it's operated faster, we have this dramatic reduction in CVs. Now, they don't all have to go at the same speed. Just a for example, I that Example we just saw with the pecan, that was about 40. Tree leaves typically about 22. So they vary tremendously based on the type of mixer wagon. But essentially, within that mixer wagon, the faster that we can do it, we're going to have a better mix. So that's just something else to consider. Finally, hay restrictor plate settings. These, these are the restrictor plates on a vertical mixer. And they're essentially just a big piece of metal that juts into the mixer wagon and forces that hay or straw closer to a knife so it can get cut. And this is what they do. If you think about a big metal jutting out into that box, it can make for a dead spot. And here we're looking at this. We see good movement in parts of the mixer wagon. And we see this big dead spot. That's where this restrictor plate is pushed out into the TMR trying to force this hay towards the knife, okay? Well, here's, this was with a Penta 1120HD. The restrictor set all the way in and across a bunch of loads of feed, saw this consistent inconsistency where there'd be a part that was really good in the front half of the load, the back half of the load had a lot of variation. And those restrictors were set halfway in and made for a much more consistent TMR. Here's this farm we just looked at, this, this dairy. Their CVs, a 6.8 and a 6.7 with those restrictor plates all the way in. With them set halfway in, they're only a 1.8 and a 1.7. Okay, much more consistent. If you are pre-processing your forage, you don't want these things set in. 
Hey, it's only if you're trying to use your mixture wagon to process the forage that you have these restrictor plates set in. Otherwise, they have a negative effect on mixing action. Final thing, get that mixture wagon cleaned out for every load of feed. This was a new patch that I had done a TMR audit on. There was close to something like 1,800 pounds of feed left in this mixture wagon. And the feeder just hadn't taken enough time to um, get it all unloaded. So ideally, our mixture wagon, as it gets to a lower weight in it, it has an automatic transmission, and this speeds up. We'll have clean-out arms in here to move feed to the door more quickly, and we can get this, get this thing cleaned out. If it takes a long time for you to clean your mixture wagon out, it's probably something that's worn out or broken in it. So check that out. But this is really important to get done because just for example, think if this would almost be the worst. Well, you can imagine feeding the pre-fresh cows the bunch of leftover lactating cow feed. Or if it's a dairy that made a grain premix and they had a bunch left over, then they went for the fresh cows the next load. And the fresh cows get a huge amount of extra grain. So that, that's bad. I mean, that's why we want to make sure we get this mixer wagon cleaned out at the end of every load of feed. So what I want you to think about here, just review the mixture management areas that we discussed today. Think about them on your dairy. What can I do better or differently on my dairy so I get a more consistent TMR both within and between loads? Just remember the reward is that this reduced variation typically leads to improved production and cow health. That's what we're all after. I thank you for your time and attention and hopefully take some questions. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Bill Stone. So um, we've got Bill here with us and if he's ready, I have a few questions for him. I am ready, Martha. All right. Thanks, Bill. Um, we've got a question here that says, what's the best way to handle ryegrass, which is typically higher in moisture and softer than alfalfa hay? Seems we have a tough time getting it short enough, a short enough particle length on it. So how would you handle uh, ryegrass or, um, yep, how would you handle ryegrass for these mixers? Uh, uh, ryegrass silage or ryegrass hay or... Yeah, um, Margaret, just to add to that, it's wrap bales at a moisture around 45%. Okay. Okay, wrap bales. Well, the, so the first thing is if you can possibly process it anymore when you're making that bale and make it short enough or shorter, that will be easier on your mixer wagon, that would be helpful. The, the next one I would look at would be how many of those bales that you're going to be using each day to feed your cows. And a, a vertical mixer is going to process that type of forage better than a horizontal mixer. We, we, as you saw earlier in these presentations, we want that forage that we feed to be very consistent. With that in mind, the best way to do it would be, let's say we're feeding five of those bales. The best thing to do would be to put them in that vertical mixer, let that mixer process them, reduce that particle size to where we want it to be, and then actually discharge those bales. Because let's say you can fit in one at a time, you would do that with all five, discharge them, premix them, just like we like to premix our forages from a bunker silo. And by doing that, then we make a much more consistent forage that we're feeding. So that would be my definitely preferred approach. Um, again, just to reiterate, if I really need to process that forage, my preference would be a vertical mixer to do that then too. Excellent. Um, we also have a question about adding whey. Should whey be added before forages or last? When do we add the whey or basically liquids in general? And typically that's those wet ingredients go on last. That's the typical way that we do them. Although I will say, especially with vertical mixers that are functioning really well with all of the uh, equipment being properly maintained and the mixer running at the, at the appropriate speed, I have seen liquids added to the grain mix and I have seen that work well also. The, the caution there would be if you're adding so much whey and you're adding to that to the grain mix that it becomes a, 
a big dough ball, then that would be too much to be adding at that time. And you would definitely have to go later. So again, in general, those liquids are added last, but I have seen, seen things done differently that have worked very well too. Excellent. Um, do you have an opinion on what the best defacer is? Or anybody can answer this question. Yeah. I'll give you my opinion. And my, my opinion is based on just what I've seen from, from dairy producers. The Fritsch defacer from Wisconsin is extremely reliable and rugged and does a real good job. So that's one that I really like a lot. Okay, um, I think you just answered this question with one of your responses to a previous question, but um, just to be clear, if you have long grass silage particles comprising a large portion of the diet, um, would you recommend a horizontal or vertical mixer wagon to adequate, adequately reduce the particle size? Right, in, in generally the vertical mixer just seems like it uh, does a better job. It's easier on the mixer wagon generally to process that than what I see with horizontals. So my preference would be the vertical mixer wagon. Okay, great. Um, I think, I think we've answered most of the questions here. Um, we can type into the chat box uh, the name of that defacer that you just mentioned. Um, somebody sure. asked for and, it again. And let me, uh, let me try to do that. Let me say, I'm sure there's other good ones out there. But this name I just typed in there is, is a good reliable one. F-R-I-T-S-C-H. Okay. Excellent. Um, Anybody else watching the chat box? Were there any other questions that we missed? One more question just came in. What particle length is a good goal for the grass silage bales? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And it's a good question because as you start to get shorter and shorter, what can start to happen is you have more and more small particles dropping out the bottom of the, the baler. And we don't want to be losing too much of our forage by chopping too short. So that's really how I would look at it. How short can I process this stuff and not lose too much out the baler and still have the baler that is making a really good sound bale. And I'm sure that depends on what type of uh, baler and the mechanism that it's using to, to chop that feed. But the, the goal, again, would be to try to make that baler do the work as much as possible versus your mixer wagon. It's expensive or a mixer wagon to process forage. It's expensive, it takes time to do it, and it's uh, wear on that mixer wagon. So if the baler can do it as much as possible, I would try to go that route. Okay, great. Um, we have a question that just says, what about rake type defacers? Yes, they can work very well, especially for corn silage. And that corn silage isn't as intertwined as what haylage may be. So I, I see them, again, working very well with corn silage. With haylage, they can work, but it's a bit, I don't know, it, it's, it's a little bit more difficult with, uh, with haylage than with corn silage. Typically, our, our larger dairies are feeding heavier corn silage-based diets, so it's not that big of a deal. The primary forage is being removed properly with that rake-type forage, and it may work for you with your haylage, but you may not. You may have to use a traditional defacer for that. Okay, great. Um, there's a question from earlier for either Casey or Dave. Would there be a difference in feeding six loads a day with lots of feed push-ups or 12 loads a day with less push-ups? Casey or Dave? Say that again. <laughs> Would there be a difference in feeding six loads a day with lots of feed push-ups in between or 12 or feeding 12 loads a day, fresh loads a day with less push-ups? Wow, there's a lot of loads. So if those are all fresh loads, 
Uh, you got so many there. Uh, I'm not sure if it would really make a difference one way or the other. Um, so just count how many, you know, how, how often fresh feed is going in plus the push-ups. And if you're, uh, if you're hitting eight or more, you're doing a pretty, pretty darn good job. Uh, and I guess I would, I would say, um, it would depend on what's going to make your day probably the most efficient labor wise. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, Casey. I, I agree. I was also just going to add that from a time budget standpoint, we know that fresh feed delivery is very motivating to cows to get up and eat. So if fresh feed is getting delivered 12 times a day, my only concern is that that would be disrupting the cow's natural um, tendencies to want to lie down and just motivate her to get up and eat, even though, you know, maybe she's, maybe she's sacrificing some long time by, by doing that. That would be my only concern with that. Yep. And from our presentations on Tuesday, we talked a little bit about the economics of, of how much time it takes to mix and deliver loads and that um, farms that did a little bit better on the bottom line uh, could deliver um, fewer loads to feed the cows per day. And I bet they were doing a lot of push-ups then. So just from an economic standpoint, labor can be pretty costly and it might take a little less time to do push-ups versus mix and deliver loads. Um, I think um, we're gonna move ahead and go over the scorecard here. So Betsy. Yep. All right. We do recognize we are a little bit over time. We are really close to the end. So please just continue to hang with us. Um, we'll have time at the very end end for any last burning questions, uh, but we're going to keep moving right now. So we just have a few scorecard questions and a couple of feeder challenge questions for this mixer wagon portion. So the first scorecard question um, for you to answer on my farm in terms of equipment and mixer wagon maintenance, give yourself a five if I have a manual for my mixer wagon and I do regularly scheduled maintenance. Give yourself a three if I do regularly scheduled maintenance but I'm not sure that it matches what's in the manual. And give yourself a one if I occasionally check my mixer wagon, usually when it breaks. And give yourself a negative one if I don't do maintenance on my mixer wagon. So go ahead and pop into the chat your number, uh, what you do, and we will keep on moving. So scorecard question number two, on my farm, the levelness of the mixer is five, perfectly level. We only load in level areas. Three, probably fairly level. We load in a couple of different areas. One, if your uh, your area is mostly level, but we really haven't checked for sure. And give yourself if a negative one if you've never checked for levelness. So that's our second scorecard question on levelness. And remember, Bill talked through that and showed us videos on levelness of the wagon. Uh, I thought there was three scorecard questions, but yes, I missed one. All right, and the last scorecard question on my farm, we evaluate a load of mixed feed. Give yourself a five if it's monthly or when we feel something is off. Give yourself a three if it's every six months or when we feel something's off. Give yourself a one if it's yearly or when we feel something's off. Or give yourself a negative one if we never evaluate loads of mixed feed. This section, we are pretty, pretty uh, mean on the negative one here. So uh, we will recap these scorecards at the end. We're just gonna keep moving. So our feeder challenge question, name three things to check to improve TMR consistency. Again, we'll go over these at the very end, but name three things to check to improve TMR consistency. And that is our only feeder challenge question. All right, so up next is the day two recap. We're gonna invite Casey back to the wheel. And then after Casey's recap, we're gonna do a brief safety video. So hang with us. All right, I will zip through these to try to save us some time. So um, okay. there we go, sorry. I was having a hard time advancing the screen. All right, so from the feed bunk management portion of the 
feeder school today, we had our scorecard a max of 10 points. So this was the feed push-ups and the plan for refusals. So allocate those points accordingly. So five is if you're doing exactly what you should be doing and zero is if you are not doing what you should be doing. So go ahead and tally up those points. Sorry guys, having some computer issues. Okay, the second scorecard was from um, Dr. Stone's portion and it was on mixer wagon, wagon. So you have a max of 15 points that you can allocate to yourself here. Um, so in terms of equipment and mixer wagon maintenance, score yourself on a scale of five down to negative one if you don't do any maintenance on your mixer wagon. Um, the next one is on your farm, you evaluate a load of mixed feed Give yourself a five if it's monthly or when you feel something is off and a negative one if you never evaluate loads. And lastly, on your farm, the levelness of the mixer is five if it's perfectly level and minus one if you never check for levelness. So go ahead and tally those up for a maximum score of 15. All right, and then our first feeder challenge question in the feed bunk management section is list three strategies for maximizing dry matter intake. And there were a ton that you could have listed. So those could include any of the following, increased feed pushups, increased TMR delivery frequency, making sure feed is available 100% of the time, limiting competition, strategic grouping strategies, and limiting sorting. So if you answered, if you had any three of those, give yourself full points. A feeder challenge bunk question number two was in Dave's portion. So your nutritionist says the feed bunk goes empty too often and he thinks your refusal are also low. He feels you're giving up two to three pounds of milk per cow per day with 300 cows going into the tank. If it's two pounds you're giving up and milk is worth $17 per hundred weight, what is the milk worth over a year's time? So a little math problem for you. And if you came up with the answer $37,230, then you are correct. In the mixer wagon section, the first feeder challenge is name three things to check to improve TMR consistency. And you could have answered any of the following, equipment wear, mix time, load size, levelness of mixer wagon, loading position, hay slash straw quality and processing, loading sequence, liquid distribution, vertical mixer auger speed, and hay restriction plate settings in vertical mixers. So any three of those would have worked to give you full points. All right, so that wraps up the feeder challenge and scorecard portion, let us know, I kind of went through that quickly. So let us know if you want me to go back through that at the very end. Um, and before we go on to the silage safety, I just want to point out that when you exit the Zoom webinar today, you will have a survey pop up. Please take a few moments to fill that out for us. It's really helpful for us to get feedback so that we can adapt to the virtual world and help serve you guys better. So um, please take a few moments and do that for us. All right, so Kathy, um, pass the control back to you and we will watch the silage safety video. From Lalamond Animal Nutrition. can help prevent injuries or even fatalities by understanding the danger hot spots when working with and around silage and keeping out of harm's way. The goal of this video is to make you aware of the possible dangers and teach you proven approaches to reduce risks. With routine tasks, there's often the risk for complacency to set in. So, when working around silage, we need to be extra vigilant. Be aware of the risks and how to minimize them. And that's what we'll be reviewing in this short video. Thank you. 
Lalamond Animal Nutrition is proud to bring you these safety recommendations, which have been developed in conjunction with Keith and Ruthie Bolson. Keith Bolson educated a generation of students about the importance of practicing safety first around silage at Kansas State University. From harvesting the forage in the field, transporting it to the farm, getting it into storage, and then feeding out the silage, employees are exposed to numerous risks in a silage program. In addition to other on-farm safety protocols, add these guidelines to your daily practices when working around silage. This video will cover these nine key tips for avoiding common silage-related accidents. Let's explore each of these points further. Tip number one is keep a safe distance. This helps prevent employees and visitors from being in the path of unexpected avalanches or cave-offs. Never stand closer to the face than three times its height. Never park vehicles or equipment in front of the feed-out face. These tips help keep people out of harm's way. Even in well-constructed silage piles, there are real risks from avalanches and cave-offs, which can occur silently and without warning. Tip number two is to sample and inspect silage cautiously. Inspecting silages, including taking samples for laboratory analysis, is critical to formulating a good ration. When done incorrectly, this can also be a serious risk as it can put the sample collector in the path of a potential avalanche or cave-off. If the pile is over 8 feet high, you should always obtain samples from a loader bucket. If the feed-out face is less than 8 feet high, you can approach a well-maintained feed-out face to obtain samples, even by using a silage corer. Choose an area that is your height or lower, always wear a safety vest, and bring a buddy. More on that in tip 4. Tip number 3 is to manage feed-out correctly. Feed-out is another time when people and silage must interact. To do this safely, remember not to dig the bucket into the bottom of the silage. This can create a dangerous overhang and increase the risk of cave-offs. Never drive the unloader parallel to, and in close proximity of, the feed-out face in an overfilled bunker or pile. Don't assume that heavy equipment can provide adequate protection in the face of a silage avalanche or cave-off. Tip number four is to bring a buddy. Always work around silage in pairs. Maintain visual and audible contact with your buddy. In case of an unexpected accident, this allows the buddy to quickly get help. Tip number five is to wear your safety equipment. Safety vests help make individuals visible to moving equipment operators and allow for easy, quick location of every employee. It only takes a second to put on a safety vest every time you're working around silage. Tip number six is to use caution when removing plastic, tires, tire sidewalls, or gravel bags. Working with cumbersome, heavy weights at height obviously presents several risks. Tip seven, do not fill piles or bunkers higher than unloading equipment can safely reach. Building your silage pile higher than unloading equipment can safely reach sets producers up for dangerous overhangs and potentially cave-offs as the silage is fed out. Our next tip is to be aware of silage gases. Silage gases tend to be heavier than air and can creep and accumulate in silos, feed rooms, or livestock housing areas and can be fatal to humans and animals alike. Carbon dioxide, the main gas produced, is colorless but may appear like a heat haze or shimmer as it is heavier than air. Inhalation can lead to asphyxiation. To reduce the dangers associated with silo gases, follow these precautions. In tower silos, properly adjust the distributor spreader so the forage will be evenly distributed in the silo and will not require anyone entering the silo during or after filling. Beware of yellowish-brown fumes or bleach-like odors at the base of a silo or bag. Telltale signs of lethal nitrogen dioxide gas. Beware of heat haze or shimmering effects, which could be due to carbon dioxide. Post silo gas warning signs at the base of the silo chute and entrance to the feed room. Stay clear of the silo for at least three weeks after filling. Ventilate the feed room with open windows and fans during the danger period. Keep the doors between the silo feed room and livestock housing area closed tightly. If you should experience even slight throat irritation or coughing around a silo, move into fresh air at once. See your doctor immediately if you suspect that you have been exposed to nitrogen dioxide gas. Our final tip is to be sure to work safely around machinery for harvesting, filling and packing, and feed out. Anytime there is moving equipment, there is risk of danger. 
Wearing safety vests can help drivers identify the location of any individuals and help keep them out of danger. It is best to plan and take steps to eliminate or control hazards in advance than to rely upon yourself or others to make the correct decisions or execute the perfect response when a hazard is encountered. The correct sizing of bunkers and piles can reduce the risk of an accident. A 4 to 1 run to rise ratio or 25% slope for ramps and sides on piles is recommended to minimize risk of equipment rollover. Spreadsheet software from the University of Wisconsin Extension Service is available to assist the silage team to better design and manage bunker silos and drive over piles at fyi.uwex.edu slash forage slash harvest or through qualitysilage.com or you can contact your Lalamond Animal Nutrition representative for information. The most important goal in every silage program is to send all employees home to their families safe every day. If a silage program is not safe, then nothing else about it really matters. We'd like to again thank Dr. Keith Bolson and Ruthie Bolson for sharing their expertise to help create the Safe Practices video. Also, thanks to Green Valley Dairy for showcasing their excellent safety protocols. For more information about safely creating quality silage, visit qualitysilage.com. This video was brought to you by Lalamond Animal Nutrition. At Lalamond Animal Nutrition, high value is put on creating and maintaining strong customer relationships. Lalamond is raising the bar and setting new standards to benefit animals and create better customer experiences. Lalamond Forward represents our ideals while keeping an eye on the future. We're delivering specific solutions and service to drive you forward. Thank you everybody for tuning in. We really appreciate your time.